Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video in my history series. This one has been highly requested. I think I get someone asking me to cover this at least once a day, which puts a lot of pressure on me to make a really good and accurate video. So here we go. Despite the fact that the British government have a lot to do with the events of the Irish potato famine, or sometimes referred to as the Great Famine or the Great Hunger, this, yet again, was something that was never taught as part of my history curriculum at school. I mean, saying that, I did take my GCSEs 10 years ago, and I know the curriculum has changed a bit now, or at least I hope it has, but I do wonder how much I really needed a whole term learning about the Treaty of Versailles. I never learned anything about the Irish potato famine. Not a thing. The Irish potato famine refers to 1845 to 1851 in Ireland, where about a million people are estimated to have died of starvation and epidemic disease, after a fungus like organism called Phytophthora infestans, which is a water mould, spread rapidly throughout Ireland, causing a potato disease called late blight, or sometimes potato blight. Late blight spreads incredibly quickly and can result in total crop failure if it's not treated quickly enough. It can cause the leaves to collapse, shrivel and turn brown. In humid conditions, a white fungal growth can be seen on the underside of leaves and brown lesions may develop on the stems of potatoes. If it's left unchecked, the disease reaches the tubers, the potatoes, and causes them to rot and become entirely inedible. And in a country where their entire diet basically consisted of boiled potatoes and buttermilk, this was a pretty disastrous disease. Potatoes are incredibly calorie dense and filling, and at the time they provided the Irish people with all of the nutrients they needed to get through the working day. You needed less potato to feed a single person than you would any other crop, and nearly half of Ireland's population at the time relied almost exclusively on potatoes for their diet. Of course this video is sponsored by Magellan TV. As you probably know we have an ongoing sponsorship and I know that so many of you have already signed up. So today I'm going to make a couple of documentary recommendations first. Up first we have Crime Files with David Wilson, which is actually a 10 part series with criminologist David Wilson, obviously, where he explores a series of Scottish crimes. He looks at everything from the evolution of investigative techniques to criminal psychology. The series is episodes on Scottish serial killers, heists, forensics, double lives and so much more. If you are a true crime fan then this is an absolutely fantastic series, it just has a little bit of everything. And the second documentary isn't true crime themed but it's just as great is called Forever Young and it's a film that challenges us to reconsider our ideas around life, ageing and death. This documentary really spoke to me like I really needed it right now because I recently turned 26 and have been going through something that I can only describe as akin to a midlife crisis. Just I can't deal with the concept of ageing and being a proper adult, it's just thrown me for a loop and it was just a weirdly comforting documentary. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, Magellan TV is a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries. I advocate education and bettering yourself and your knowledge at every opportunity, so I really cannot recommend Magellan TV enough. They have everything from true crime to science, history, nature and everything in between, with new programmes added weekly you can watch anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of the programmes are available in 4K as well. There's never been a better time than now to dedicate your time to educating yourself and learning something new. So the potato had been introduced to Ireland around 1585 by Sir Walter Raleigh. He'd travelled to Europe about 15 years earlier and it had been in Europe from Spaniards coming in from South America. The potato was the perfect food and quickly became part of the staple diet for many of the reasons I mentioned previously. But the only problem was that potatoes are particularly susceptible to disease. Before the 1800s, late blight was a disease only known in Mexico, but by 1842 it travelled up to New Hampshire and Vermont in the USA. From there, it made its journey over to Ireland. The fungus had travelled to Ireland in the holds of ships transporting goods across the Atlantic from North America to England. The winds from southern England carried the airborne fungus to the countryside around Dublin, where the conditions just happened to be perfect for the fungus. The fungal spores settled on the leaves of healthy potato plants and fields around the city. They then multiplied and were carried by the light breeze over to the next field, and then the next, and then the next. Under the ideal moist conditions of Ireland, a single infected potato plant can infect thousands more in just a few days, and those thousands go on to infect hundreds of thousands more. Which is a very interesting parallel with COVID-19, I'm saying that out loud actually. <laughs> 
The plants fermented and caused a deep stench across the country. When the potatoes were finally dug up, they were found to be completely unviable. It wasn't unusual for there to be crop failures occasionally due to particularly bad weather or other diseases, but there had never been anything to this extent before. The farmers didn't know what to do and the effects of the crop failure hit the people quickly and it wasn't long until it became catastrophic. The disease hit the crops year after year due to infected tubers surviving in the ground from the previous season. Although the direct cause and effect of the potato famine was simply there being a lack of potatoes, the ramifications were more serious than anyone could ever have predicted, thanks in part to the British, of course. At the time, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, effectively governed as a colony of Great Britain. Between 1801 and 1922, Ireland was ruled directly by Westminster. The British government were the ones to appoint Ireland's heads of state, known as the Lord Lieutenant and Chief Secretary of Ireland, although residents of the country could elect representation to Parliament in London. In all, Ireland had 105 representatives in the House of Commons and 28 in the House of Lords, but still the bulk of these elected representatives were landowners of British origins and or their sons. Any Irish man who practiced Catholicism, which was the majority of Ireland's population of course, was initially prohibited from owning or leasing land, voting or holding elected office under the penal laws. Essentially, the people representing Ireland in Parliament were not representative of Ireland in the early 1800s. In 1829, the penal laws were largely repealed, but the effects would continue to be felt for many years and were still rippling by the time the potato famine came around. Most land in Ireland was owned by English and Anglo-English families. Irish Catholics were relegated to work as tenant farmers, forced to pay rent to the English landowners. So basically, Ireland had representatives in Parliament, but they didn't really, because the Irish people didn't really have a fair say. By October 1845, Westminster was well aware of the potato blight in Ireland and it was their job to help fix it. But Irish leaders in Dublin had to actually petition Queen Victoria and Parliament to actually do something. But of course, many people at Westminster didn't want to do anything to help at all. The religious social reformers viewed the blight as a blessing from God that would provide an opportunity for them to transform Ireland. It finally gave them the chance to be able to control Ireland even more. And even some Catholics in Ireland saw this blight as a divine punishment from God, punishing the abusive landlords and landowners. But only of course, the landowners and the landlords didn't really get affected by this, they had money. It was the poorest of the people who were really affected by the potato blight. The Prime Minister at the time was Sir Robert Peel. He established a scientific commission to examine the problem in Ireland, which soon issued a report saying that over half of Ireland's potato crop was likely to perish. The very potato crop that over half of Ireland depended on for its entire diet. So Robert Peel made a big and controversial political decision to repeal England's long-standing corn laws, to allow them to import large amounts of American grains. But this issue very much split Peel's party and he simply didn't have enough support from others to push the measure through. People cared more about their money than the millions of people starving over in Ireland. Ireland had suffered regional famines in the past and they were always fixed with next year's harvest. But the government failed to really pay attention to the fact that this was the whole country this time. This wasn't just an area of Ireland that was struggling, this was an entire country. And as we know, it wasn't fixed with next year's harvest. It would continue for years. So instead of repealing the Corn Laws, the government enacted some temporary relief measures. A relief commission was set up in Dublin to help set up local relief committees throughout Ireland. The idea was for the higher people in society, the landowners and the clergy, to distribute food to the poor and raise money, and then the British government would contribute a matching amount. Only the problem is that many of the relief committees were taken over by poorly educated farmers who had no idea what they were doing. The local landowners then wouldn't donate money and therefore there was little for the British government to match. Over that first winter, the government spent $100,000 on American maize to be sold to the starving people. The Irish called the maize Peel's Brimstone and not just because of the yellow colour. The maize was something new to the Irish diet. It wasn't particularly nutritious or edible in its natural state and required a lot of preparation. It was a useful emergency food in theory, but it had to be ground into digestible cornmeal and there just weren't enough meals available in Ireland to do this. 
The maize also had to be cooked properly and for a long time to be nutritious in any way. In Mexico, they used lime to help break down the maize, but of course the Irish didn't know this, and even if they did know this, they didn't really have lime. The maize was hard for the Irish stomachs to digest, which were just used to potatoes. It would cause them to get bloated, ill, their digestive systems just simply couldn't process it properly. Many people also began to become afflicted with scurvy as a result of this new diet, as the maize was severely deficient in vitamin C when compared with potatoes. And it is worth noting as well, that the Irish did produce more crops than just potatoes. There was plenty of wheat, dairy and meat, all of which was of course exported straight to England. A small amount of this produce was sold in Ireland, but the people simply couldn't afford it. So the farmers had to sell to England to earn enough money to pay their rent to keep farming. Soon after this, Conservative Sir Robert Peel is forced to resign and Whig leader Lord John Russell becomes Prime Minister in June 1846. He did such a bad job that his ministry was said to be the ruin of the Whig party. It never composed a government again and he was just as inadequate, if not more so, than Sir Robert Peel. Russell appointed a man called Charles Trevelyan, who had served as Assistant Secretary to the Treasury for years under Peel's administration, but Trevelyan's personal views matched much more closely with that of Russell's administration. They both subscribed to the economic theory of laissez-faire. Essentially, they believed that the free market would simply sort out the problem without any kind of government interference. They refused to interfere with the movement of food in Ireland and then halted all of the previous government's relief work, leaving hundreds of thousands of people in Ireland with nothing. They had no access to work, no money and no food. This new Whig government believed that the Irish wealth should relieve the Irish poverty. Only the problem was there was no Irish wealth. Most of the landowners in Ireland were actually English and the standard man didn't earn enough to pay taxes to contribute to this so-called Irish wealth. Again, it was just a catch-22, but this time a catch-22 of poverty. Trevelyan oversaw everything to do with the famine in Ireland, from the comfort of Westminster. Reports say that he visited Ireland just once during the famine years and even then he only visited Dublin, which whilst was affected by the famine, was nothing on the harder hit West. He subscribed to the idea that the Irish were already lazy and giving them too much help would simply encourage this. It all came down to moralism, this idea that the Irish were suffering because they had a national character problem. The English saw the Irish as violent, filthy, lazy and reliant on them. But it did soon become clear that the government's policy of do nothing and it will sort itself out was not going to work. Shocking, right? Parts of Ireland were so poor that in some rural areas, they actually lived by the old barter system, trading goods and labour instead of actually exchanging money. Based on this alone, money not even existing in parts of Ireland, Trevelyan's plan was always destined to fail. It got to a point where people were literally eating grass to live. The last thing the Irish needed now was a bad winter after two crops failing in a row. So of course, what they get is a particularly bad winter. The winter of 1846-1847 was blizzard after blizzard, homes being buried in snow, in a country that was quite used to fairly mild winters. Cold for sure, but snow was a rarity. By January 1857 it was clear that things were not working themselves out, and Russell's administration modified its policy and made money available on loan for relief. He came up with a public works relief plan for the country, with people basically doing useless building projects, such as building stone roads, high energy, back-breaking jobs. But as I said before, people still weren't earning enough to get taxed, and therefore this back-breaking work was zero help to the economy. Soup kitchens were eventually established across Ireland, but by this point it was too little too late. Food supplies started appearing in the Irish ports, and the incredibly high food prices did drop by half, sometimes even to a third of what they were. But this didn't really matter when the people were literally penniless, they still couldn't afford it. A lot of people were already suffering with dysentery because of the famine, and this watery soup was dangerous, it made people so ill they decided no food was better than this food. This year is often referred to as Black 47, the year that deaths really started to occur, after years of malnutrition and starvation. It wasn't so much the hunger that killed people, but the diseases that came along with years of malnutrition, the dysentery, typhus, cholera. Entire families made homeless by the famine were found dead at the side of the road. This happened so often that it even earned itself its own name, road fever. The dead were often buried without coffins, just a few inches below the soil, and often weeks after their deaths. 
They would die inside homes where the rest of the household was simply too weak to do anything about it. They would just live in households with dead bodies because they were too weak to move them. Of course, some of the only people to help were the Quakers because you can always rely on the Quakers to lend a helping hand. They helped set up their own soup kitchens, but there are only about 3,000 Quakers out of Ireland's population of 8 million, and they could only help in the areas in which they lived. There were very few Quakers in the West, which was the worst affected area. A member of the English Quaker community, William Forster, came over to assess the situation and see what the English members, English Quakers, could do to help. He observed of the children, like skeletons, their features sharpened with hunger and their limbs wasted, so that little was left but bones, their hands and arms in particular being much emaciated, and the happy expression of infancy gone from their faces, leaving behind the anxious look of premature old age. Even the Native Americans did more to help the Irish during the famine than their own government did. In 1847, the Choctaw people sent $170 to help families, which is equal to over $5,000 in today's money. It was an incredibly generous gesture. The gift came not long after the US government had forcibly relocated the tribe and they were struggling themselves, but they felt immense empathy for the Irish situation, having experienced very similar pain during the Trail of Tears a decade earlier. You may have seen in the news recently that the Irish were finally able to repay the favour, with hundreds of Irish people giving to a charity drive for two Native American tribes suffering in the pandemic. It seems that almost $2 million were donated in return. By the autumn of 1847, things finally seemed to be looking up when a blight-free crop was finally harvested. Only because the Irish population was so malnutritioned, not enough potatoes had been planted back in the spring. There was only a quarter of the amount there would be in a normal year, enough to feed only a quarter of the population. So people started to flock to the workhouses. Whilst over in England, the workhouse was the last place that people wanted to be because the conditions were so incredibly poor, in Ireland, the workhouses became somewhat of a final saving grace for the people. The conditions were still destitute. They were awful, awful places. But the people were granted food and shelter in exchange for work. Many people died in the workhouses because the conditions were so bad, but it was preferable to dying on the streets. The figures for deaths in workhouses spiralled uncontrollably in famine years, rising from 6,000 in 1845 to 66,000 in 1847. The population of the country fell from almost 8.4 million in 1844 to 6.6 .6 million by 1851, but it wasn't only due to death. About 1 million people did die, but an equal, if not a higher amount of people actually emigrated. The population fell by between 20 to 25%, with the majority of the emigration happening over to the USA, which had a growing Irish population by the day. By 1850, the Irish made up a quarter of the population in Boston, New York City, Philadelphia and Baltimore. The conditions were so dire in Ireland that it was literally easier to uproot your whole life and head to a new country than it was to just make it work at home. Emigration became somewhat of a rite of passage. Most young adults would get on boats over to the USA as soon as they reached a certain age. The journey over on the boats wasn't exactly easy either. Many of the passengers would already be ill before they boarded and there would be a lack of sanitary facilities and food and clean water on board, meaning lots of people died on the journeys. If they couldn't afford travel over to the USA though, which of course did cost money, which most people didn't have, the Irish would jump over to England, Liverpool being most people's first stop. They knew that once they'd landed on British shores, there were food handouts for free across the country, much better than anything the government provided for Ireland. But the British didn't want them though, and laws were soon passed to ship the Irish back home. If they were found to be homeless, they were put back on a boat. By September 1847, the Russell government ended what little relief it had made available, effectively deciding the famine was over. They decided not to use any more central funds to alleviate the famine, but put all of the burden on the Irish tax-paying landlords. But most of the landlords avoided paying this tax by using the Gregory Clause, by which any tenant with a plot of over a quarter of an acre was not considered destitute and was therefore not eligible for relief. In reality, it didn't matter how much land a tenant had, if they couldn't grow anything on it, and they couldn't. Only one third of the landlords actually contributed towards the famine relief, which was no use. The winter of 1848-1849 was another hard one, rife with disease, although the weather was much more mild. The fever and the dysentery began to wane after the winter, but many, many more people had died, weakened by the hunger. The government began a campaign to try and get the farmers to grow green vegetables and root crops other than potatoes so this wouldn't happen again, but the Irish farmers were stubborn and didn't want to give up on their traditional farming methods. 
the Quakers come in and purchase a model farm to try and teach farmers new methods of agriculture, but it had very limited success. Also, people just didn't have the energy to learn something new. They didn't have the energy to learn how to grow new crops. Ireland was exhausted. Once again that summer, the potato blight struck, but not with the same intensity that had the previous years. It didn't help that although the dysentery had died out, an epidemic of cholera was thriving, one that had actually struck in England as well as Ireland. Cholera didn't discriminate between the rich and the poor, the hungry or the fed. It was just one thing on top of another for years on end for Ireland. And it got a lot worse before it got better, but it did eventually get better. By 1852, the famine had largely come to an end, not thanks to any huge relief effort. It was in part thanks to the potato crop recovering and in part due to the population now being significantly smaller due to the death and the emigration. The population of Ireland as of 2019 is said to be 4.9 million, much smaller than it was before the famine. Although we do have to take into consideration that the country lost a significant chunk of its population in the form of Northern Ireland to the UK. There's a lot of argument over how much responsibility the British government should take over the famine. It's one of the biggest blots on the Irish-British relationship, even today it causes a lot of tension. Some speculate that it was an intentional genocide on behalf of the British government, that they intentionally planted the disease on Irish soil and waited for it to take hold. But most historians say that it wasn't an intentional mass killing, it was more of a case of catastrophic neglect and blindness. I think we could all probably agree that if the British government acted with more kindness, with more willingness to help, then there probably would not have been as much death as there was. Alongside laissez-faire, a lot of people in government were also acting on the belief that the famine was an act of divine providence, an act of God. And who are you to mess with the actions of God? Although we don't have exact numbers of deaths, it's thought to be at least one million, which you'd like to think that any God wouldn't be contributing to. The greatest mortality was not from malnutrition or starvation, as you'd expect, but from famine-induced disease. In 1997, on the 150th anniversary of the famine, Prime Minister Tony Blair issued a statement, which mounted to the first apology ever expressed by the British government. Although the words apology or sorry weren't actually uttered as far as I can see. But he did say, the famine was a defining event in the history of Ireland and Britain. It has left deep scars. That one million people should have died in what was then part of the richest and most powerful nation in the world is something that still causes pain as we reflect on it today. Those who governed in London at the time failed their people. And the Irish Prime Minister responded in kind by saying, whilst a statement confronts the past honestly, it does so in a way that heals the future. There's no denying that the atrocities committed by the British government and the monarchy throughout history still holds deep scars today. The famine in Ireland led to a huge loss of human life and a huge amount of people abandoning the country altogether, changing the course of the country throughout history. The government couldn't have prevented the potato blight from happening, or maybe they could if you believe the conspiracy theories, but there's no denying that so much more could have been done to provide aid and help. The fact that all of the produce that was still being grown in Ireland had to be sold to England says a lot. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope that I managed to like get the main points in there. There's so much about the Irish potato famine that this could have been like a three hour long video, but I've got to make it succinct and something that you guys will enjoy watching. So I hope I did it justice. Let me know what history stories you want me to cover in the future. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you then. Bye guys.